All right, welcome to this episode. Today we're going to be talking about bolted connections and more specifically bolts themselves and some of the different types of failure phenomenon that we have to investigate as we're trying to do design of connections. Typically, in, as a structural engineer, we spend the majority of our time working with the detailing of connections. The actual design of the members themselves, the whether they're beams or they're columns or what have you, the different various elements are generally pretty quick to design, but it's the layout and the configuration of the connections that we spend a lot of our time trying to work our way through. So for us, um, today we're going to be talking about bolts, okay, and more specifically shear connections of bolts. And there will be some other cases that we'll, we'll talk about later on, and I'll kind of point those out as we go today. But for now, that's where we're going to start. So the first thing I want to do is kind of run through some of the details of bolts themselves and connections. All right, so basically what a connection is, is it's basically it's a method of connecting one element to another for the purpose of transmitting a load. Okay, now when we talk about connections in steel design, there are two major categories that we deal with. One is by use of uh, mechanical fasteners, which would be your bolts and your rivets, and then the other would be uh, via any of the various forms of welding. Okay, and so those are the two major categories that we deal with, and those are the two major categories that are covered in AISC in great detail. All right, okay. Now, some of this information we've seen in our studies before, Okay, um, we kind of break our types of steel connections into a couple of different classifications. There is uh, one that's uh, kind of a bearing support, okay, in which one element is pushing on another. Okay, uh, you can think of things like a base plate design where you have a column that's pushing on a base plate that is then pushing on a foundation. Okay, the bolted connections, while they do some of the work, they're not critical to keeping that member in place. The second one that we're going to deal with, and the one we're going to focus on today, deals with bolting, where basically if I fail a bolt in a, you know, in a structural fastener connection, we have a real problem in our hands, okay, that the, you know, that the, the connection itself and the forces are transmitted directly through the connecting elements, All right, and what we mean by that when we say this is, for the bearing connection, we had something that looked kind of like that, and in this case, the load was here. Right, and if I had anchor bolts holding that it's kind of the position is in its place, if I lost the anchor bolts, whatever the surface is here would still work out okay. It would help hold things up. In a bolted connection, we're now looking at something that looks like this, and this is a side view of a shear connection, and maybe there's a couple of bolts that kind of come through here. If I break the bolt right there, this thing breaks in two pieces. And so that's why they're kind of classified a little bit differently. Um, the third one then is welding, which is kind of a, a fusing of molten metal from one piece to another by by melting it. Okay, and then the metal hardens and kind of forms a filler element with the help of an electrode and a bunch of mechanical apparatus. Okay, now in the realm of structural fasteners, okay, it kind of breaks down into into two major categories. The first one is rivets, and we don't really do a whole lot with rivets anymore. Um, just because of the, the, how labor intensive they are and the amount of effort and even the danger associated with them. If you remember rivets, these were kind of those, um, if you've ever seen those old uh, Bugs Bunny cartoons, you know, from the, the 70s and 80s and probably even before that. These were the ones where, you know, you always saw the, you know, Bugs or Elmer Fudd or somebody up on the top, you know, building a building and had these molten red hot rivets that some disaster always happened. They dropped it on somebody's head through their helmet or some some craziness like that. Okay, um, they take a lot of effort. They you, um, they're they're hammered into place. You know, basically I have you know two plates with a, a hole that's preset in them, and I put this rivet through kind of as a as a piece that looks, you know, in a very simplified sense, it's a piece that looks kind of like that and they stick it in to the hole and then they deform the back end of it, usually by beating it with a hammer or something in order to cause it to, to heat. Now rivets are very, very good in that they go in red hot because they have to be able to be deformed once they're in place. But it's usually a two-man operation. One guy holds the bolt in the place and the other guy hits it from behind trying to, trying to mash this thing and it kind of basically flares out and basically connects itself or spreads out past the hole and then when it cools off, 
these things are very good for making a very tight connection and that when the metal you know when the metal is heated it's this long and when it cools it starts to contract and so it really clamps down and you get a tremendous clamping force as a result of these okay and so some of our older structures you know even iconic ones like the empire state building were made completely out of rivets and they're still performing magnificently to you know even to this day so so that's kind of what a rivet is um we're not going to talk about that in this discussion but at least when you're aware of the other classification of what falls into a structural fastener okay the one we're going to focus on then is bolts or more specifically threaded fasteners okay and these are our typical you know bolt and nut type of assembly okay um, it's almost exclusively what's done. They're very easy to install. You can have one person doing it now. Um, they're a lot safer. Um, there's not as much danger. You don't have to have a heating element, you know, 30 stories up, you know, because, you know, if I took a rivet, you know, heated it on the ground by the time I got it to up to the 30th floor, you know, it would be cooled off and I couldn't deform it. So you always had to have a heat source very local to where the work site was. Okay. So within the realm of threaded fasteners, there's a whole lot of different ASTM grades, but the most common that we're going to be looking at and that are commonly used in practice are the A325 and the A490. Okay, and we'll talk a little bit about what the significance of that is here in a second. All right. Okay. All right. So uh, some of the basic properties that we have um, for for bolts and material properties. Okay, the A325 is hands down probably the most common in construction these days. It's a medium carbon steel. It has, a, a, has an ultimate stress of somewhere between 81 and 92 KSI as part of the specification, all right? And so the 325 um, is falls into a category known as Class A, okay, or Group A. And you'll see this popping up in, in the tables extensively, okay? And then the 490s are an alloy steel with a lot higher strength. I mean, you look at the difference between these numbers, that's, you know, what, 30%, 40% higher than the A325, right? They're a lot more extensive, okay, but they can do a lot more. Uh, they're, they're also a lot stronger as a result, and they vary from 115 to 130 KSI, okay, and that's a, a 490, and you'll see those called as the Class B or the Group B for those. Um, now, typically, bolts um, in these two classes only go up to about an inch and a half, okay? Anything larger than that's a special order, and that generally moves you into some larger diameter metal, um, which may be an A449 or... Um, you could be dealing with a stainless steel grade, which would be an A304, or something like that would all be different types of metals that you'll see. But hands down, these two are the most, are by far the most common of what we're going to be dealing with. All right. Okay, now, a little bit of the anatomy of a bolt. Okay, just to kind of give you some, some, some terminology. There are a lot of variables that go into this. Um, typically, we're not real worried about the dimensions of the head. It's usually a hexagonal type shape or some sort of stamp or some sort of sort of marker that shows up on this something indicates oh this is an a325 okay um i've seen it where inside that circle it's just a series of tick marks okay that's always a, a possibility okay and so then that's our head and so what happens is is we put the head of the bolt and then our plates come in say there okay and maybe i have a washer maybe i don't okay but then there is um what we call the bolt length which goes from the bottom of the head all the way out to the end and this bolt length is broken up into two regions okay okay this is the shank of the bolt sometimes called the shaft of the bolt okay and then we have this threaded length and this is the guy you got to pay attention to because depending on the dimensions of these two they're not standard you know if i need a lot more threaded region i can get them with a lot more threaded region or i can get them as an all thread where i don't have any shank at all okay and where these threads occur in relation to our failure surface becomes a major major consideration um, that we'll have to be aware of and keep kind of in our in, in mind as we're looking for for all of that. Okay. All right. Now, the most common types of loading for bolts and shear fall into a, a couple of different categories. There are what we call the direct shear cases, which would be these two. And in this case, you can kind of see I've got the whole outline here. You know, and that's where the bolt would be. Okay, and if you think about this connection, and the, the only way that I would fail this connection, one way of failing the connection, there are lots of ways to fail it, but the way that we're looking at what gives this one its label is the fact that if I broke that bolt right there, you know, assuming that these plates weren't connected in some other way, okay, then that would be a, a consideration for us. Okay, this is what we call a direct single shear connection because there's only one, one failure surface that exists, right, or one shear plane that exists. All right. If I look at the next one down, this is what we call a double shear because now, again, here's the bolt, and you've got a hole through three different plates. 
okay and if i broke it here and i broke it here broke the bolt in two places i would have a way of sliding that plate out okay and this is what we call a double shear these are probably the most common of it you can get triple shear and you know quadruple shear and those kind of things but single and double shear are probably the most common okay now again that's a direct tension type of connection or, or sorry a direct shear type of connection usually usually in tension members is this member and this member and this member are all tension members because the forces are pulling on them okay the one that does not fall into this category we have to consider a little differently and we'll have a video on this one is what we call the eccentric shear connection okay which i have some sort of plate and then a load that's put up here whether it's coming from a beam or some other connection and what happens is, is this plate wants to kind of rotate you know relative to the center point of this whole pattern okay and so as that thing tries to rotate on there then all of these forces and the bolts start to try to try to pop up and resist our forces caused by whatever this distance is from here over to here this is the eccentricity of the connection if you will and that becomes a variable in the design so this basically p times e is a moment and then we basically break down the resistance of all the forces and the bolts based on a counteracting moment and so there that's why the forces turn and then there's some direct shear and some other things there's a lot that goes into this but that's what we call an eccentric shear connection that's not the scope of what we're going to talk about today or even in the in the example in the next video okay all right all right now some of the other considerations that we want to look at okay uh bolted shear connections in ai in the aic manual okay they're covered in uh, section j3 of the specification um, i believe it's on 16.1.126 that will get you back if you want to flip through it okay and there are a couple of different issues that we look at when we start talking about um, the design of the bolts um, of the bolted connections okay well, the first one is, is is that there's a possibility that I could size the bolt correctly, but if the bolt's sitting in this hole, okay, if I don't size the plate or the piece connecting next to it appropriately, then I could end up failing it on the front edge of this hole, okay, and that would be what we call a bearing failure of a bolt, okay. There's also the phenomenon where um, we have a bolt in a hole and I load it in such a way, and if the hole, the bolt, and generally this occurs when the bolt is too small or the plate is too thin that I can literally rip out the piece of material immediately adjacent to the hole. Now this is different than what we talked about in our last video when we were talking about block shear. This is on a per hole basis and I basically I rip this chunk out. Okay, and so what happens then is, is that these distances, the distance from the bolt to the edge of the member or the distance of the bolt to the member right before him, all of these become factors in how strong this thing can be. Because if I make this too small, this bolt isn't able to establish its full shear capacity and I fail to play it around him, but the bolt is still perfectly fine. So this is one of the failure phenomena. okay? Um, I affectionately call this one the slicer phenomenon. I don't think that's the technical term. It's, a, it's actually a, it's a, it's a tearing phenomenon, I think is what AIC refers it to. I call it slicer because I picture the old cheese slicers, you know, the old Velveeta block with the wire, and it's kind of that same thing. This is the one that, you know, you can test this one by, you know, putting a paper clip or a, p a pencil through, through your paper and then ripping it out, okay, and that's the phenomenon that you would get for this tearing failure, okay. And then, of course, breaking of the bolt itself, okay, and this isn't too hard. I'll show you the table where the information comes from, and then I'll show you the shortcut table as well here in a couple of minutes. Okay. Okay, all right, so for all of the connections that I just showed you, whether it's a direct shear or an eccentric, or the eccentric shear connections, okay, they are all shearing connections of the bolt. So one of the things that we want to look at is what the shear strength of, you know, how do we determine the shear strength of our bolt? Okay, and in this case, um, in all cases related to bolts, you notice that when I showed you the material properties, we always listed the ultimate stress. FY didn't mean anything because the deformations are generally so small that, a yield deformation does nothing so we just use the ultimate strength and as a result that almost forces our fee to be 0 0.75 okay now the basic equation on this um, falls into something like this that the capacity is going to be equal to whatever this nominal shear stress is multiplied by the area of the bolt that's failing in shear multiplied by some constant value okay and now in this particular case this is for one for one shear plane our constant then has to do with um, where the failure plane occurs in relation to the bolts. Okay, now for um, F and V, this nominal shear stress shows up. And let me grab the book here. Okay. 
whether you're talking about tension in bolts or shear in bolts, they all come out of this table J3.2. Right. And so you can see that there are a whole lot of different categories that follow up. We've got 307s, group A, group B, group C. Um, first column will be your tensile stress. This is your FNT value. You'll see that show up in one of the later equations. And then we have the FNV value um, for a particular grade of bolt. Okay, so for group A, this is, these are the lines that we're dealing with usually, all right? The FNV is going to be 54 KSI, and it's 90 KSI in tension. All right, so a lot of information comes out of this table. In fact, a lot of the information that we're going to be dealing with, such as things like the nominal hole dimensions that you see on the next page, and even edge distance values all come out of this particular section within two or three pages. So if you're bookmarking this, this is generally a really good section to bookmark when we start talking about bolts. All right, let me slide that out of the way. And we can kind of get on to what the others are. All right, so that was F and V. It's just, it's just a tabular value. It's not a big deal. Okay, the ones that that are a little bit more crucial to us is one is, the, um, is this AB value. Okay, and the AB is the area of the unthreaded section. So this is that shank area that we talked about. This would be the area up here. Okay, because the way they manufacture these is they cast these bolts as solid chunks and then they use a tap and a die or they mill out the threads from that. So this threaded region is actually a reduced area on this section. So if I took a section here and I compared it to a section here, they're different areas. In fact, it's about a 20% difference. On here okay and so whether your failure plane occurs up here or whether your failure plane occurs here okay that becomes the value of the constant all right if my threads are in the shank the unthreaded portion okay which would be what we call the excluded case so you'll see an X running around is our excluded okay, and then you'll see an N that stands for included because we all know that included starts with N right okay so, so these are the cases that we're dealing with. Okay. All right. All right. Now, turns out, as we said, that the included case would be where, you know, this, this plane, this faying surface, which is the plane that exists between the two plates. So, you know, if my connection is doing, again, I keep using the same simple shear connection, right? Okay, that's the failure plane. Okay, it's the plane. That line that I'm showing, the bolt is coming through this direction. Okay, that's that failure plane. That's this line. Imagine this bolt's turned 90 degrees, okay? So what we want to do is we want to be careful on, you know, when we spec out our bolts, you know, that if I want the higher capacity, I got to make sure that I get a bolt that has, you know, a, a threaded portion on, the, you know, that has an extended threaded portion that ensures that that's where that failure plane is occurred. And that's kind of a, a hard thing to do sometimes because, you know, these plate dimensions are fairly small. Or maybe I haven't detailed all the plates out, but I know how many bolts I need. And so specking this guy out is a little bit cumbersome sometimes. And it's, you know, you also have to make sure that, you know, when the bolts arrive on the job site, that they have the right dimensions for what you as the engineer was expecting. So a lot of times in practice, what I do is I just assume that it's a thread included case always. Spec it that way. I use this reduced strength, you know, with the 0.8 for the threads included. On there and then I don't have to worry if they send me the wrong bolt and it's just a little bit of cheap insurance I mean they buy these bolts you know they don't you don't buy two or three at a time you buy them by the hundreds or thousands at a time they come in big drums and you just pick out what you need so um, out of that out of that particular size so so that's our included case is this failure occurs through the threads as opposed to the excluded case which is where the failure plane occurs through the shank of this okay and so the designation that you'll see on bolts will be something like oh it's a325-n or a325-x this tells you what you're expecting and what the strength capacity is going to be based on this bolt and a lot of times this will show up in your drawings or on your details there'll be something that calls that out that n and x will always be there okay all right now how do we how do we handle it handle the formulas for it okay so the case is is that um, the threads included, we're going to take the, our, our reduced phi RN value is going to be our phi value 0.75. We have our FN value on here and then our area of bolt, okay, which is the, the shaft diameter of the bolt. So when you call out a three quarter inch diameter bolt, that's the diameter that goes in here. This is pi over four dB squared. Get you that guy, okay? And then if the threads are included, I put on a 0.8 uh, reduction on it. That's that 20% difference. Okay, for threads excluded, I don't have the reduction. The formula is exactly the same otherwise. Okay. And so you can kind of see where those values were coming on uh, that I just showed you on that one table. Now, like I say, it's a fairly, there aren't that many sizes of bolts. 
okay, and there aren't um, just there aren't that many variables, there aren't that many gradesables, there aren't that many sizes, okay. So I'm going to point you to a really handy table, okay. In fact, there's two of them, but this is the one I want you to look at first, okay. Um, and that is in Table 7-1. This is uh, Section 7 of the, of the manual on page 7-22 of the 15th edition. Table 7-1 is our available shear strength of the bolts, okay. And it's very easy to read this table. I apologize, it's a little blurry, but I think we can make it out here is that the table is broken into the grades of the bolt. So group A, group B, group C. So this was my A325, this is my, my, my 409. Okay, and so that's the first thing. The first thing you do is you choose out the, gr the group of bolts. So let's say I'm looking for an A325 bolt. Okay, and then I read across and the next column you come to is inner X. So are the threads included or are the threads excluded? Most of the time I come up to the included on there. Okay, so now I read over on this set of lines. You notice it, inco it incorporates two lines and I read on across Okay, and so if we look at the loading on this thing, the S and the D show up, that's single shear and double shear. All right, so most of the time, most of our cases fall out of here. So all I do is I figure out, oh, single shear, it's the top line, double shear is the bottom. And then I just read across through all these tables and the diameter of the bolt that I want is here. So I've got five eighths, I've got three quarter, I've got seven eighths, one, and then what, one and an eighth, one and a quarter, one and three eighths, and one and a half down below. Okay, and so that's as hard as it is. So all those the, the equations that they showed you with the ends and the X's and the single shear and the double shear and all that for say a 325, you know, one inch diameter bolt with the threads included in single shear, I would go N S one inch, got it, 31.6. Sorry, 31.8. Okay, that's all there is to it. And so that's all there is for the capacity of the bolt itself. So the, the bolt itself is fairly easy. And this table makes it really handy that if I'm trying to, you know, I don't haven't designed the connection yet, but I need to get some idea of how many bolts I'm going to need because there are going to be some guidelines I'll show you in the next example that have to do with, well, how do I arrange these bolts? You know, are they multiple rows? Are they a single line? The geometry of the connection itself is where we spend most of our time. And so this will give you some idea of how many bolts you need for the connection in the first place. And then I can go start laying them out to get my details and my patterns um, for the actual connection details. Okay, but on the table on the next side, um, is very very similar okay except this is where you can get the available tensile strength of the bolts okay and so again it's the, the, the group of the material and then this one doesn't even have the X or the N or the S or the D it just you read off your diameter come down and grab your size and you've got it it's a piece of cake so these two tables are very very handy in fact for years when I worked in a, a design office I had this one not out of the 15th edition but out of older editions it was on the wall of my cubicle because I used it so stinking much Okay, so it's um it's a good one to mark as well. All right, let me put that away. Okay, all right. For so that's kind of how we handle the shear bolts. Okay, for the tension strength of a fastener, that was the J three point six and the, that table seven seven two that I just showed you. It's the same kind of game, except now it's the capacity of the bolt, the 0.75 fee, and then the tensile stress that came out of that table. That, that, first, that very first table that I showed you, okay, multiplied by the area of the bolt, okay? All right, so that will get us to there. All right, and so with that, I think looking at the time, I think we're going to go ahead and stop this one here. That's kind of the layout of bolts in general and some of the, the major table, tabular values. In our next video, we'll talk more about some of those other calculations that we can do, the with you know the bearing strength and the slicer strength and, and those kind of things, spacing requirements. I think that'll be a good place to stop. So um, as always, if you will, um, if you've got any feedback or comments, we would appreciate those. Leave those down in the in the comment section below. Uh, please make be sure to like or subscribe, and we'll keep the videos coming as we start to go. I hope this is just kind of a little bit of information about basic bolts and some of the factors that we're looking at. So, anyways, hope you all have a great evening. Um, happy engineering.